All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Covenant City Church. It's a joy to be able to worship with you here in the Lord's Day again. If this is your first time here, my name is Tazar, one of the elders here at CCC. And as always at CCC, what we do is we want to help everyone who's present here today to participate in the act of worship because we believe that worship is not just something done by people up here and observed by people sitting, but it's something that all of God's people do uh, in, in this time of worship. So you should have already gotten a, a liturgy printout, uh, or you can follow in the screen behind me as well as we go through the order of worship, where I'll ask you to stand up and sit down, read Bible verses, pray together, and, and all of that. Okay? So let me pray for us, and then after I pray, I'm going to invite us to read out loud our call to worship today, taken from Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9 to 13, can be found in your printouts. Let's pray. Father, your people come to you again this week with mixed feelings between knowing we don't deserve to be in your presence after all that's happened this week and knowing that you've called us to approach you and worship you. And Father, may this confusion be settled when we see the cross where you shed your blood so that sinners like us can be forgiven and receive the righteousness that we need to approach a holy, holy, holy God. May you be pleased by the worship of our hearts today as we sing back your word to you, as we pray back your word to you, and as we preach your word to your people. May the Spirit make these words clear, make the gospel loud as it seeps to every part of our liturgy today. Be gracious to your people, O Lord, and may you be pleased with the offering of our hearts today. In Jesus' name and in his name alone, we say amen. Friends, I invite us to rise. <clears throat> And let's read out loud together. I'll call to worship today, taken from Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9 to 13. Please read with me in one voice. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works, as God did from his. Let us, therefore, strive to enter that rest, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, <clears throat> piercing through the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Amen. Friends, let's worship the Lord together. It's a beautiful Sunday. Let's worship Him together. We all sing. You made the starry host. You traced the mountain peaks. You paint the evening sky with wonders. The earth, it is your throne. From desert to the sea. All nature testifies your splendor. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Sing His greatness, all creation. Praise the Lord, raise your voice, you heights and all you depths. From furthest east to west. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. You reached into the dust. You reached into the dust. In love and spirit breathe. You formed us in your very likeness. To know your wondrous words. To tell your mighty deeds. To join the everlasting core. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise 
Praise the Lord, sing His greatness, all creation. Praise the Lord, raise your voice, you heights and all you depths, from furthest east to west. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. sing let symphonies resound let symphonies resound let drums and choirs ring out all heaven hear the sound of worship let every nation bring its arms to the king a roar of harmonies he took praise the lord praise the lord of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise teach me some melodious sonnet some by flaming times above praise the mountain fix upon it mount of thy
Let's just sing, oh, to grace. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Amen. Please be seated, friends. Friends, let us pray one more time. Lord, our Father, we know you are the creator of heaven and earth, Lord. You set the stars in the sky and know them by name. You have created every hair on our head and you know their number. And Lord, you see through the depths of our hearts. You see the thoughts and intentions of it. And you see exactly how unworthy we are of the love that you so graciously give us every day. Father, as we come into a time where we get to meditate and begin to understand just a bit of how unworthy we are, I pray that you can give us this grace of the Holy Spirit that we may be real with ourselves, that we may acknowledge how broken we truly are, for it is only then will your grace taste as sweet as it's supposed to. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, our call to worship comes from what for me is some of the most sobering verses in the Bible. Because it reminds me of at least two things, right? Firstly, that there is indeed a Sabbath rest for the people of God. That there will be a day where we will no longer have to be burdened by the anxiety and conflict and worry that we daily have to deal with how there is going to be a time where we get to fully rest from our work and our toil, and that this future reality is what today, our earthly Sabbath today, is supposed to testify to. But secondly, to enter that rest, that eternal Sabbath, we must also work, right? It's clear in the text that we must strive to enter this rest because we can indeed fail to enter it. And how we fail to enter rest is clearly there through disobedience. And the metaphor that our, that our text uses to communicate how we can actually avoid failure is striking. It says that we must allow the Word of God to pierce us to the very depths of our soul. We must allow the Word of God to live with us, be active in us, such that it exposes the parts of ourselves that we are most scared of admitting, that we want to bury the most, until we can no longer live in denial of how truly broken and repulsive our sin is. Sounds like a pretty uncomfortable process, doesn't it? But it's actually a good thing. Because the truth of the Word of God and the beauty of the gospel, friends, will set us free indeed. But before that, it will challenge us deeply, grieve us, or even offend us. However, this is a necessary step. Because the only way we can be proactive in resisting and rectifying our sins consistently and with the urgency that it needs is to really, 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 really see how much a problem sin is in our lives and how we can never solve it on our own. Because, as our confession of sin text will remind us, what the sinful heart actually wants to do is we want to get comfortable living with our sin. 
We don't want to be guided by the Word of God. We don't want to change or control ourselves because we love doing what is right in our own eyes. I know that I personally have convinced myself often that it's better to risk it, to go my own way and go down swinging, right? Be prepared to risk and suffer whatever consequence than to admit that I'm wrong and that I need help. And the reality is, friends, that this text reminds us that though we may think that we're getting away with it right now, that God isn't doing anything but our sins right now, God is keeping receipts and we're going to have to pay. God cannot be perfectly just and good if He lets anybody get away from anything ultimately. So the more we willingly ignore Him and do our own thing, we are only being kept for the day of judgment and we are heaping judgment upon our own heads. So let's read together this sobering reality from 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 to 15. Thus says the Lord. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. Bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones, whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the God, Lord. But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction, suffering wrong as the wage for their wrongdoing. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in the deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children. Forsaking the, way, the right way, they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing. Let us confess how we have truly become irrational and have gone where even angels fear to tread in our silent prayers of confession. Lord, we admit that though we might not realize it, we foolishly rush in where even angels fear to tread. We do not understand, Lord, the magnitude of your authority. We willingly take you for granted, your goodness and your supremacy. Father, I pray that you will not let us be comfortable rebelling against you. Show to us, Lord, how indeed false our way is, how harmful and self-destructive it is that we may come to you in repentance and humility and lay down our passions and desires, deny them for the sake of obeying you, for it is in you and with you alone can we really experience that which is truly life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, when we have to own up to all the messed up things that we have done in our lives, when all of those unspeakable thoughts and desires are exposed before God on the day of judgment, indeed, it's going to get ugly and it'll be utterly shameful. When everything else is taken away, only then will we realize how unworthy we are. And I'm a Calvinist, right? I believe in total depravity, and I feel terrible about myself every day. But even now, I only have the faintest idea 
of how dark my sin truly is. However, it seems to me that it is in fact when how dark it is is exposed, when the fullness of its depravity is shown, will the gospel actually be most beautiful to me and the love of God be totally appreciated by me. Because the message of the cross tells us that in order to cover for our ugliness, God himself became human and took on all our shame and guilt so that he can give us his perfect love, so that we can be beautiful and precious to God once more. God sees how awful our sin is, but because of Jesus' perfect obedience, he can tell us, no, you are beautiful and you are worthy. Before we did anything to deserve it, when we were at our lowest and more shameful points, Jesus changed who we are in the eyes of God and made us new. He did that for us, friends. So for our assurance of pardon, what I want to do is read you guys a section from the prophet Isaiah, actually, that tells us beautifully the change of status the people of God experience after Jesus has covered us and chained us from our sins. From Isaiah 62, verse 1 to 5. Hear now your assurance of pardon. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not be quiet until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a burning torch. And the nations shall see your righteousness and all the kings your glory. And you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. And you shall no more be termed forsaken and your land shall no more be termed desolate. But you shall be called, my delight is in her and your land married. For the Lord delights in you and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, shall your sons marry you and the bridegroom rejoice over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. Amen. Friends, I just said to our feet and sing this song together. was lost in darkest night yet thought I knew the way the sin that promised joy and life and led me to the grave I had no hope that you would own a rebel to your will and if you had not loved me first I would refuse you still hallelujah all I have is Christ As I ran, my help I was indifferent to the cause. You looked upon my helpless state and led me to the cross. And I beheld God's love display. You suffered in. for me I know I know is great hallelujah hallelujah all I have is Christ hallelujah 
live so long might see the strength to follow your commands could never come from me oh father use my ransom life in any way you use oh father use my ransom life in any way you choose and let my song forever be my only boast is you hallelujah all i have is christ hallelujah jesus is my life hallelujah all i have is christ hallelujah jesus is my life hallelujah all i have is christ hallelujah Jesus is my life. Amen. Friends, please be seated. Today's statement of faith is taken from Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 20, sections 3 and 4. Please read out loud with me. Those who practice any sin or nourish any sinful desire on the pretext of Christian freedom, destroy the whole purpose of Christian freedom, which is that having been rescued out of the hands of our enemies, we might serve the Lord without fear and in holiness and righteousness before Him all the days of our lives. Chapter Sections 4. God intends that the authorities He has ordained on earth and the freedom Christ has purchased should not destroy, but mutually uphold and preserve each other. And so, those who oppose any lawful power or the lawful exercise of power, whether civil or ecclesiastic, on the pretext of Christian freedom, are actually resisting God. The support, promotion, or practice of such a position which contradicts natural understanding or the known principles of Christianity on matters of faith, worship, and associations, which denies the power of godliness, or which disrupts the peace and the unity among believers, should lawfully be called to account and proceeded against by the church. All right, thank you, Adit, for reading that, or leading us in that reading. And friends, if you're new to CCC and are wondering why, we read these documents that aren't from Scripture itself, but archaic documents, or seemingly old documents, um, because we believe that there are documents out there that faithfully summarizes what the Bible teaches, and we kind of match the theme and also the intensity uh, of what we read every week on the sermon passage that we'll be preaching on that week. Okay, so uh, take, uh, learn these documents, study them for yourself. I think it'll be uh, edifying for you as well. Okay, and friends, as we continue in this time of worship, uh, we're going to move on to our times of tithes and offering. Um, and again, if you're not a member of Covenant City Church, uh, we never want to make you feel uh, pressure to give to CCC, but we do want to encourage you to give to your local church, wherever it is that you're a member in, so that you can help them in their uh, worship and making of disciples here in the city that uh, we love. But if you are a member at CCC, then it is a duty and delight for CCC members uh, or for a church member to support the local church upon which they are uh, worshiping in. Uh, so if you'd like to give uh, to us, uh, you can give through the QR code here behind the, behind the screen, screen behind me on the, on the page or through cash by the offering bag that will be passed around. Okay? Let me pray for us, and then we'll continue in this time of worship. Father, we understand that nothing we do or give 
uh, can make us lovable in your sight, but only what Christ has done. And as we ponder upon the gospel, as we sing the gospel, as we liturgize the gospel story in every single part of our uh, Sunday morning worship service, that you would make it speak in our hearts and let us respond in worship by acknowledging that all we have is not ours to own and to use our own way, but it is um, things for the furthering of your gospel work, the glorifying of your name, and the building up of your bride here on earth, which is the church. Be with us, Father, as we give to you, and remind us again of the one who became poor for us on that cross, uh, so that we may become spiritually rich in him. In him and in his name alone we pray. Amen.
Amen. Please be seated, friends. Friends, let's pray one more time. Father, we come to you and acknowledge that this church does not belong to us. These people do not belong uh, to CCC. Um, but all of this belongs to you. And as we acknowledge that, let that truth be true and represented in the way we use the resources that you've entrusted us that would not be used just to build up our own kingdoms, but for your glory and for your name. And Father, I pray that you'd give us the wisdom to know how to allocate the resources you've entrusted to us. I pray for the Mercy Ministry. I pray for all the other ministries. I pray for uh, those who are in need uh, in and outside of the church that you'd give us the understanding about how to, how to appropriately uh, allocate these resources. But Father, we also know and understand that the problem with financial allocation is not a wisdom issue. It's a heart issue. It's not that we don't know what to do about it. It's just that we love it too much. And I pray that you'd make our love for you be greater than our love for any resource on this earth, no matter how shiny it might be. And I pray, Father, uh, for other uh, members in this church that are going through times of need. I pray for those who are experiencing ailments and sickness, that you would guide them through this process and their families as well. I pray that those who are in material need, I pray for those who are in relational need. I pray that we would be a church that cares and loves for each other as we lead each other to you. And Father, we pray that other churches in the city will also have the same attention and desire for your glory, understanding of your gospel, that they too may be able to use what they have, not as things they own, but as things you've given them for your glory. And Father, we want to start praying for our nation as well. Uh, you called us to pray for the government and for the rulers of the land that you have placed uh, in a place to care for it and to, to, to lead it, to, guide, to guard it. I pray that you would uh, continue to be with us as, um, as, as the powers that be here continue to determine the operations of this country, that you would allow freedom of worship, and that you would uh, allow your people and your church to know how to navigate through the complications that might exist um, in, in these seasons. May we be a church that not only blesses those who are here, but also the city that we're in, through whatever it is you've entrusted to us. Father, we pray, we end this time of intercessory prayer in the way that you have taught your disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, friends, welcome again to Covenant City Church. I do have two quick announcements before the kids are dismissed. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, because this pertains to the parents as well. Uh, the first one is that there will be a parents' informational meeting next Sunday, okay, for the parents, uh, from 1245 to 145 after church. Uh, we're going to introduce the new student ministry that we have going on. So we were getting a lot of kids ages uh, 8 to 17 to 18 here at the church, and we have someone now to care for that particular uh, demographic. I don't know if the guy's here, and I haven't told him that I'm going to do this, but is Oswin here by chance? Is he in the congregation? Can he stand up if he's here? He's not here. Okay, maybe he's hiding. Well, his name is Oswin, and he's uh, going to be caring for our student ministry. So we're going to introduce him and that work uh, then, so please come. We're going to share curriculum and resources for at-home discipleship for, for our families, and we're wanting to connect parents to each other and to the larger community, okay? Uh, this is open for members and for those who are looking to be a member here at CCC, even though you're not a member yet, you can come. And please register by Tuesday if you want to do this. I, think, I believe registration will be at the Church Center app. Um, so please go there and register then. Second announcement for the parents before we dismiss is that the children's ministry is in, always in need of, of, of volunteers, but more specifically this time, 
Uh, we're opening another preschool class. Our preschool class is getting a little bit too big, so we need two classes now uh, for it to operate well. So we need more uh, volunteers for that class. And also we need female teachers for the female students who may be coming to the catechism classes. Okay, these are for the el older uh, uh, kids, ages 8 to 12 uh, or so. So please, if you uh, want to do that, you don't have to be you don't have to have a theological seminary degree. You know, all you need to be is uh, 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 able to, to do the vows that, that we do and, and know um, the details of that, okay? So if you want to help and serve us in that way, please uh, let Eunice know. Um, so we're looking for a nursery volunteers, preschool volunteers, and a female catechism teacher, okay? The QR link should be behind me. Um, also, contact children at covenantcitychurch.id for any further questions. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, kids, you're dismissed to the children's ministry, to the door in my left, and as they do that, friends, I want to invite the rest of us who are still here to rise and please greet each other in the name of the Lord. Okay, I have uh, three more announcements, okay, as we also wait for the parents that are taking their kids to Sunday school come back. Um, important announcements. One, if, as always, if you want to get connected to Covenant City Church, you want to know more what's going on, please download the Church Center app. All of our events and programs are there. Uh, number two, we have a welcome lunch next week, okay? The place is to be decided for this is uh, for anyone who wants to fellowship after church, okay? Members, non-members, please come. Sunday, uh, October 29th, after church. Uh, if you want to register for that, please register in the bit.ly link behind me or in that QR code if somehow I turn invisible and you can scan it um, somehow. Uh, or I'm sure you can uh, connect with uh, any of our staff and they'll tell you how to register for that as well, okay? Um, second and last announcement here is men's conference. We announced this already before, but we want to just announce it again. Uh, our men's conference this year uh, will be on the topic of gospel at work. And if you want to <clears throat> know more about how to connect your Christian faith with your nine to five, with your day job, with your career, okay, we encourage you to come to this. And I think what's going to be a little bit different about this conference um, is that a lot of conferences out there do a good job already in teaching you kind of the doctrine and the theology behind what work is, you know, telling you what work's about, the biblical basis for that. Let's call that the hardware, okay? A lot of conferences out there are also very good in telling you the application of what to do. You know, you gotta do A, B, C, D if you want to be a good Christian at, at work or whatnot. Let's call that the software. But I think what we're gonna try and give you in this conference is kind of the middleware, okay? how to get from this point to this point. What are some things you need to do? What are some ways you can think about uh, moving all this theology that you know to the application, okay? So not, not just one or the other, but, but the middle. And I think uh, that paradigm to bridge your theology with application will be really helpful. That's what we're gonna try to do here. So if you wanna be a part of that, uh, men, please register now. Uh, the earlier the better, but the deadline is November 5, okay? November 5th, all right? So please do so also through Church Center. Um, I believe. Okay. All right. Let me pray, and then we'll continue in our uh, preaching of the word. Let's pray. Father, as we open up your scriptures and we uh, presume to have the ability to understand what the words of an eternal God might could possibly be for finite sinners like us. We understand at the same time it is beyond our power to truly get it. At best, we may understand it in our brains, but not truly, truly embrace it unless your spirit gives us the mercy 
and that ears to hear, as our passage will emphasize again today, to hear what it is you have to say. So please speak in a way to these people that a preacher could never do on his own. And may your word be loud and clear as Christ shines forth to be the hero of our story. In his name and in his name alone we pray. Amen. Okay, so friends, we are continuing today in our mini-series through the book of Revelation. Again, we're not doing the whole book. We're just going to be doing chapters 2 and 3, where God, through the Apostle John, explicitly addresses seven different churches that existed around the island called Patmos, which was the island that the Apostle John happened to be exiled to at the end of his life for being faithful to the gospel. Okay, so this is his address to the seven churches around that island. Two weeks ago, when we started the series, we saw how God addressed the first church, which is the church in Ephesus, right? Last week, we saw God address the second church, which is the church in Smyrna, okay? And today, we're going to see how God addresses the third church, which is a church in this place called Pergamon. And what's interesting, I think, about this third church in Pergamum is that it can actually be contrasted with the first church God addressed, which is the church in Ephesus. Why? Because in a sense, the first church in Ephesus and the third church in Pergamum are polar opposites. If you remember, the first church in Ephesus, they were rebuked by God because they had good, robust theology, they had really good doctrine, but they were also cold and loveless toward people, right? They didn't care about the people around them. Now, this third church in Pergamum, they're being rebuked for having bad heretical doctrine. Why? Because they care too much about what the people around them thought of them. So, Ephesus, the first church, was doctrinal but cold to the world. Pergamum, the third church, was syncretistic, meaning that they synced themselves with the world to where their doctrines and their practices kind of was no longer Christian, right? They were syncretistic, but they were welcoming to the world. And here's why I think this is interesting is because I feel like this is also kind of the tension that a lot of people feel here in Indonesia as they look at the church scene that exists here today. At least that's my experience. When I ask churchgoers or Christians in Indonesia about their process of how they choose a church to settle as a member in. Most of the time, and I'm curious if if you kind of feel this way too, most of the time I hear this dilemma in their answer because they say, man, it's, it's, it's so hard. The options I have are between doctrinally robust yet cold, loveless churches like the Ephesian church, which they usually associate with a particular denomination, which we will not name. (laughs) Or on the other hand, they say we have doctrinally weak, syncretistic churches, but are very accepting and warm and welcoming, which they also often associate with another denomination, which we too will not name. And here's the thing. A lot of people respond to them and say this, well, it's easy. Just find a church that's in the middle, right? But that answer won't satisfy the serious church member. You know why? Because the serious church member will know that being in the middle is the worst. Because that means you're being half doctrinally cold and half syncretistically warm. You don't want that. The goal isn't to be half doctrinally cold and half syncretistically warm. The goal is to be both doctrinal and warm. But that's a different sermon for a different time. Neither here nor there. Okay? But for us, CCC, God already asked us to be self-critical about whether or not there are Ephesian-like doctrinal coldness in our church two weeks ago when we talked about the church in Ephesus. And I think what God's asking us to do today in this passage is to flip the coin and to see whether or not there are syncretistic Pergamum-like tendencies in our church as well. Okay, so let's, let's be critical on that side. Let, let's get into it. This is God's word. Take it from Revelation chapter 2, verse 12 to 17. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. 
yet you hold fast to my name. And you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, so that they might eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice sexual immorality. So also, you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore, repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except, except the one who receives it. Thus says the Lord. Okay. How can we, CCC, pinpoint syncretism in our church family, and if we see it, how can we deal with it, and lastly, why should we care? Or, let me put it this way, point one, Satan's way of loosening our grip, point two, how to address weakened arms, and point three, the name we'll hold on to at the end. Okay? Let's go to the first point. Satan's way of loosening our grip. So it's important to note here that before God rebukes the church in Pergamum, he first encourages them. Look at verse 13. He said, I know where you live, and it's not an easy place to live in. It's where Satan's throne is, God says. It's like, that's pretty intense. <laughs> you know, was Pergamum that bad of a place? But, but uh, John here wasn't talking about crime rates. He was talking about the amount of false worship that was happening in that area. Pergamum was actually the city where they first built the temple that started worshiping Caesar Augustus as God, okay, emperor worship, which at this point has become a nationwide religion, but that was like the epicenter. That's where it all started. And then on top of that, they had other big temples as well. They worshiped false gods like Zeus, Athene, Demeter, Dionysus, and, and, and tons of other false gods. And Paul is saying here that all this false worship, that's evidence of Satan's strong presence. And if you happen to be living in a pergamum at the time, and you refuse to worship any of these false gods, you'd be cut off from society. You'd be excluded from trade and commerce deals. deals. Your business will suffer. Your family will be harassed. To the point where, uh, John says, one of the church members in Pergamum named Antipas in verse 13, he was killed for refusing to worship these false gods. But yet, God said in verse 13, even despite all of this intense persecution, you held fast to my name. You didn't let go, and you did not deny my faith. It's encouraging. So apparently, Satan's method of directly pushing back the church in Pergamum, from the front lines, it didn't work. But God tells us here that another method worked. What method? Look at verse 14. God said, but I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. So first, let me explain that eating food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality, that's not just a list of bad things. That's a reference to idol worship, okay? Because those are the two things that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and in Revelation chapter 3 is, is said to be involved in these pagan worship festivals, okay? They would feast and they would conduct sexual immoral acts during the worship service. So, so apparently, whatever method Satan switched to here worked, it got people in the church of Pergamum to, to commit false worship. But what did he do? What was his method? How did he get the church in Pergamum to finally give in? Well, John specifies here in verse 14 that whatever strategy Satan used in Pergamum, it was the same exact strategy he used against God's people in the Old Testament through two people named Balaam and Balak. Right? That's what he says here. And if you're not familiar with the story, let me just summarize it real quick. So, back in Numbers, chapter 22 to 25, there is this scene where after Israel was freed out of Egypt, 
They got big, they grew numbers, and they settled for a moment near a land called Moab. So, naturally, their cattle started to eat the grass around Moab. Their people set camp and consumed the natural resources surrounding Moab. And the king of Moab at the time, named Balak, got really worried that his resources are being eaten away. So he wanted Israel to disappear, to go away. So what Balak did is he went to this pagan priest named Balaam. And he told Balaam, look, Balaam, if you curse Israel for me, I'll give you a lot of money. But before Balaam was able to do that, God appeared to Balaam and said, don't you dare do it. Those are my people. Don't you curse them. So he didn't. And for like two and a half chapters afterwards, Balak, the king of, uh, um, the king of the Moab, kept trying to convince Balaam to curse Israel, and Balaam kept saying, no, 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 over and over again. After a while, Balak gave up at the end of Numbers 24, and they went their separate way. But then, here's the twist, out of nowhere, in the beginning of Numbers chapter 25, Balak, the king of Moab, got this idea. He said, you know what? If I can't directly curse Israel out of Moab, you know what I'm going to do? I'll just turn them into Moabites. Great idea. Genius. So what he did was he sent Moabite women to seduce the men of Israel. And after they were all enmeshed, Numbers 25, verse 2 to 3 says that the Moabites invited the Israelites to sacrifice to their gods, and the Israelites ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel yoked himself to Baal of Peor. Balak's strategy worked, but we're not done yet. It's another twist. It's a twisty story. Do you want to know who gave Balak this idea to seduce Israel from the side instead of attacking them directly from the front? It was Balaam. Hold on. I thought he was a good guy. I know. I did too. I was fooled. Apparently, he wasn't. How do you know it was Balaam? Because later in Numbers chapter 31, Balaam was punished alongside Balak for seducing Israel toward other worship. And that's why in verse 14 of our passage today, it says that it was Balaam who taught Balak to put this stumbling block before the sons of Israel. So, let me summarize. Apparently, at some point between the end of Numbers chapter 24 and the beginning of Numbers chapter 25, Balaam secretly came back to Balak and told him, Look, if I curse Israel directly, their God's going to punish me and you and all of us. It won't work. Here's what you've got to do instead. You've got to lure and seduce them with worldly pleasure, make him worship Moabite gods, and that way, either their God destroys them or they become a Moabite without neither of us being liable for it. See? Win-win. Now give me my money. Friends, Satan doesn't always loosen our hold of Christ head on with the sharp edges of a sword. More often than not, it's slowly with the soft lures of worldly pleasure. And don't get me wrong, Satan does use direct persecution a lot, even for people here in CCC. But for the most part, at least in my experience here in CCC, I don't feel like direct, explicit persecution has been Satan's main method of choice with us here so far, has it? I think he knows that if he does that, we're just going to double down and hold stronger to Christ. I think he knows a better method to use for us would be to lure us to the world, not crush us with it. Why? Because look around. This room is filled with a lot of ambitious people who have very easy access to the things of the world. That's not a brag. That's a warning. For many of you, the world's out there for the taking. You have the means. You have the connections, you have the resources, you have the education, you have the swag. You've got it all, which is fine and good. But just beware 
that makes you the perfect target for Balaam's method. And as we just saw, Satan's been perfecting that particular method for centuries now. Like Balaam, he'll start by caressing your God-given desires. Then, he'll make you doubt that the manna or the provision God's given you for today is enough and is sufficient, which is, by the way, why I think John refers to manna in verse 17. And if you believe that, it'll be really easy to convince you that the only way you can fulfill these longings is not by trusting God, but it's by doing things your own way, even if that means breaking God's commands. Step three. And if you get there, you know what usually happens? You, you don't leave Christianity completely. No, no, no. You stick around the church, and I think this is part of Satan's strategy. You stick around the church, and you become like the Nicolaitans here in verse 16. That's why they're mentioned. The Nicolaitans were a heretical sect of Christianity at the time, and they claimed to be Christian, but wasn't at all. Because all of God's doctrines in that church has been butchered and tailored to support their desire of fulfilling their longings in the way that they deem best. And if we don't deal with that, CCC, before we know it, the only difference that our church will have with the world is that we're using God's Word to support our carnal desires. And that's it. And at that point, we've been Balaamed. We've been Balaamed. So what do we do, CCC, if we notice or sense seeds of Balaam in our church? Okay, let's go, let's go to our second point. Move on to verse 16. God says, therefore, repent. If not, I'll come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. So the first thing we see here about how to respond to seeds of Balaam, seeds of syncretism in our church, is to first appreciate the gravity of the situation. Okay. God said that if you don't repent, I will come to you soon. How personal this threat is should make us shiver. Not a messenger will come to you soon. Not legions of army angels will come to you soon. It's much worse. I will come to you soon, God says. And what will God bring? We'll go back to verse 12. How did John introduce God here first in verse 12? He said, these are the words of him who has a sharp two-edged sword. What does this mean? This means that God's justice is consistent. See, we often think God's sword or God's justice is to be pointed only to idol worshipers out there. God's saying, no, 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 no. It's pointed at idol worshipers everywhere, even in the church. It's two-edged. By the way, we see this happen in Numbers chapter 25 as well. So, you know, rewind back to the Balaam story in Numbers 25. After Israel fell into Baal worship, you know what God did? He sent a plague to Israel. And 24,000 Israelites died, Numbers chapter 25 says. A plague. A plague. You remember when's the last time God sent a plague somewhere? It was to who? It's to Egypt. God dealt with the Israelites in the same way he dealt with the Egyptians. Listen. Just because we're worshiping health, wealth, and prosperity in the church... It doesn't make us any safer from God's wrath compared to if we were worshiping health, wealth, and prosperity outside of the church. These aren't magical walls. It's not about where you worship. It's about what you worship, who you worship. So when the seeds of Balaam, inside, you see it inside the church, the first thing we do is to realize that these walls aren't magical walls. It's not about where we worship, it's what we worship, and that God's justice is consistent and that should heighten 
the reverence we have about this issue. But a second thing we should realize is that God's justice is also accurate. It's not only consistent, it's accurate. Where do we see that? Look at the end of verse 16. God was very specific about who he'll come for. If you don't repent, God says, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. God didn't say he'll war against everyone in the church with the sword of his mouth, but specifically who? Them. Who's them? We'll go back to verse 14. It's the people who hold the teaching of Balaam. So the Indonesian phrase here would be, jangan pukul rata. You know what I mean? Don't use the same hammer, the same sized hammer, with every single person. When you see people in the church who has syncretistic tendencies, who, who want to mesh God's truth with the world, twisting God's word to justify their own desires and flesh. Don't just go, all of you be damned. That's not God's justice. That's lazy justice. Not everyone's equally liable. And again, we also see the same pattern of justice occur in Numbers chapter 25 as well. After God sent the plague to Israel, God told Moses, look, unless you punish all the chiefs of the people that led Israel toward the syncretism, this plague won't go away. God was very specific there as well about who to punish. Not everyone, but the chiefs of the people who were leading this movement. Yes, I'm not excusing people from their personal responsibility to God. 24,000 people still died in Numbers chapter 25. But there are those that are particularly responsible, and they were the chiefs of the people. Look, we all care about doctrine here, okay? This is a Reformed church. We don't like syncretism. But some people in the church, you got to understand, they might have syncretistic tendencies because perhaps they've grown up in a Christian home where their parents took them to these kinds of churches throughout their childhood. And what's a young kid going to do? You know, is he going to tell his parents, hey, stop worshiping health, wealth, and prosperity so that you don't confuse my idea of Christianity and produce habits of idol worship in my own Christian walk when I grow up? No kid's going to say that. Have compassion. Be accurate with how you apply God's justice, okay? For some, this might be all they've been conditioned to know. But other people, on the other hand, might be the ones doing the manipulating, They might be the ones purposely twisting God's word and fooling his children, prostituting the church, if you could say, for their own gain. Be accurate, not lazy, in how you apply God's justice, okay? And be afraid of God's justice. Intense stuff, I know. But number three, I think there's another thing that we need to look at, and it's actually not particularly in our passage today, but we get this uh, back from the Balaam Balak story, Numbers chapter 25, and I don't usually take applications from another passage to apply it to another passage because that's not accurate, but because our passage today so intimately entangles itself with the events in Numbers chapter 25, I think for this one it's appropriate, okay? For us to take a look at how Israel repented back then in the Balaam episode. This is the third thing about how to respond to syncretism in the church. Let's take a closer look at it. Something happened before Moses was able to punish all the chiefs of the people, which would have been hundreds of people, at least, by the way. Something happened. A man named Phineas, Aaron's grandson, who was one of the priests back then, if you know, um, he was also an Israelite priest, said this, led by a jealousy for God, that's key, In Numbers chapter 25, led by jealousy for God, he stood up and he pierced through two people with a spear, two people who seemed like they could have been some of the main perpetrators of the syncretistic idol worship movement. And after Phineas did that, this is what God said in Numbers chapter 25, verse 10 to 13. He said, Phineas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest, has turned back my wrath from the people of Israel. In that, he was jealous with my jealousy among them. So say, uh, so that I did not consume the people of Israel in my jealousy. Therefore, say, I be- behold, I give to him my covenant of peace, and it shall be to him 
and to his descendants after him the covenant of a perpetual priesthood because he was jealous for his God and made atonement for the people of Israel. So, the piercing of these two people apparently satisfied God's wrath and made him relent from his original command to where he withheld killing all the chiefs of the people and, he, and the plague stopped. And I actually think this is the application of our passage today. The application of revelations in our passage today is to be like Phineas. Be like Phineas. What do you mean, Tess? We got to pierce through syncretistic Christians with a spear? No, no. We got to be jealous with a jealousy for God. That's what Numbers 25 said motivated Phineas. What does it mean, friends, to be jealous with a jealousy for God? It means that the reason we would do any of this. The reason why we would point out heresies and syncretism in the church is because we want God to receive the affection and the love that he should be getting from his people. It means that the reason we painstakingly keep the purity of doctrine in the church is because in the depths of our bones, it pains us to see God get cheated on. That's why. Not because, for example, we just like the drama. You know, Pastor so-and-so said this in a sermon three Sundays ago. (gasps) What? Yeah, I know, right? Kind of. It's so juicy to talk about stuff like that, isn't it? Don't do it because of that. Or don't do it because you just want to feel better about ourselves, you know, or it makes us feel more theologically superior than other people. No. If you do it for those reasons, the execution will be all over the place. Do it because it pains us to see the love and the glory that our God should be receiving get robbed by false idols. If you're not like Phineas, if you're not jealous with the jealousy for God, one, you won't care that much about executing God's justice, and two, you definitely won't be accurate in how you apply it. Because now you're doing it for all kinds of other reasons, and you you may end up hurting the situation more than you help. Okay? So if you're going to do it, be like Phineas. Do it because you have a jealousy for God. So now, the question is, how can I be like Phineas? How can I develop in my heart a kind of jealousy for God that makes me do what he did? Let's go to our last point. The name that we'll hold on to in the end. Okay, so God ends this whole passage to the church in Pergamum in the same way that he did with the other churches, with a promise. He said this. Look at verse uh, 17. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone so that uh, that no one knows except the one who receives it. Tons of confusing imageries. What's this all about? Let's talk about it. It's all about Jesus. First, this hidden manna. What's that about? Well, remember, manna was this bread provision that God would periodically give to feed Israel in the Old Testament as they journeyed in the desert towards the promised land. Okay, that's the manna that would come down from heaven. And if you go to John chapter 6, do you remember what the apostle John said about who Jesus is? He's what? He's the bread of life that came down from heaven. He is our true manna. He is the true provision of the Lord. Okay? But what's this white stone about? Well, this white stone is just another way to describe this manna. If you remember the Old Testament, this manna is often described as round and white, like a white stone. Okay? So it's two of the same things. So what's God, what God's saying here is this. He's saying, I promise I promise you'll be provided for. Although right now, it doesn't feel like that. Right now, maybe for some of you in this room, that sense of provision feels hidden. It's hidden manna, you see. Right now, when you stick to the truths of God's word, right now, when you align yourself to God's truths, 
it may cause the world to take away from you the provision that you need to survive. Obedience to God might make you lose money, status, and perhaps the most painful of all, relationships. And there will be times where you'll wonder, truly wonder, down to your bones, whether or not I love you. God's saying here. Whether or not I care. And in those moments, you'll be very tempted to take matters into your own hands and sink my truths with the world in order to minimize your losses. Don't. Don't. For those who conquer, you will see that the tears you shed now won't be comparable to the glory that is to come. Why? Because when the day of glory comes, you'll find yourself associating with he who owns all things, the risen Christ, which is what the new name here is talking about. It's association with the risen Christ. When you receive this white stone-like manna, God says, there will be a new name written on it. And this isn't a personal name, like, you know, if my name is now Tazar, later I'll be named Magnamous or something cooler like that. <laughs> no. What name will be written on this white stone-like manna? It's Jesus' name. And we know this because Revelation chapter 3 says, to the one who conquers, I will write on him the name of my God. And again in Revelation chapter 22, we will see, when we see Jesus' face, his name will be written in our foreheads. So, when the story ends, we will hold the name of Jesus in this white stone-like manna. And what God's saying here is that it will be worth it. Whatever possessions the world take from you now, whatever losses you experience now, Jesus will provide for that longing in the end. And whatever shame that this world inflicts upon you now, you will possess a name that is more honorable than all other names, and that is the name of Jesus. And will all be worth it. Hold on. Okay. I see how that promise motivates me to not give in to the world, but, you know, it, it really hasn't motivated my heart to be jealous with a jealousy for God's glory. Well, that's because you forget why, friends, you get to hold on to Jesus' name in the end. Why does the Bible say you get to eventually have this privilege of holding tightly unto Jesus' name in the end. Why do you get to do that? It's because Jesus first held on tightly to your name on the cross. On the cross, Jesus said, whatever debt is under Tazar's name, I will pay so that whatever credit is under my name, he gets to hold on to. You think the piercing of two sinners in Numbers chapter 25 is what soothed God's wrath? You think the piercing of two sinners in Numbers chapter 25 is what made God relent from his justice? No. You know what did? Let me read to Isaiah chapter 53. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was a chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. The only reason why you get to hold on to Jesus' name when the story ends is because he held on to yours during its worst part. And if you have ears to hear, 
the gospel that was just proclaimed, then perhaps a jealousy for his name might begin to appear in your heart. And you shall find yourself begin to say, should not the lamb who was slain receive the glory for which he suffered? That sentence is what will combat Satan's lie. That sentence is what Phineas heard. May it be on repeat in our hearts, friends, till the day we can fully partake in this hidden manna. Let's pray. Father, this world and the prince of its heir, who is Satan, is very skilled in making your church and your people eat the fruit. He's very skilled. We were just born yesterday. He's been around for centuries. We do not have the sobriety, the strength, the purity of worship to combat his lies. We pray that as we see your gospel, your spirit will use its power to protect us and remind our hearts again to keep going, to hold fast, to not give in, yet be gracious and kind and warm at the same time as we look and remember how the story ends where we will be with you once again, associated with the King of Kings who suffered in our place. In his name and in his name alone we pray. Amen. Friends, let us all stand together and sing the last song together.
I know how the story ends. I know how the story ends. We will be with you again. Sing, you're my savior. You're my savior, my defense. There's no more fear. No more fear in life or death. Let's sing that one more time. I know how the story ends. We will be with. We will be with you again. And you're my Savior. And you're my Savior, my defense. No more fear, no more fear in life for death. Let's sing it one more time. I know how the story parts of my job is to ask other people to sacrifice for the Lord. Because I know your stories and I know what some of you are paying. It's much easier for me to just do it myself. But I want you to hold on because we know how the story ends. Keep faithful no matter the cost. Love your God. Keep worship of him pure. Receive now, friends, your benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you, be gracious unto you. The Lord give his countenance upon you and give you peace. Now go in his peace. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.